first of all, th- thanks for coming. It's uh, great to be talking about data quality. It, it doesn't sound like an interesting subject, but uh, actually I think what, what's really exciting about, about this whole drive for regulation, um, including the data quality side of it, is that we're going to be massively changing the way um, systems at, at banks are, are managed. Um, and it's, uh, it's got a really good turnout, and uh, I, think, I think for good reasons. Yeah, so, so my name is Greg Soulsby. Uh, these are my uh, contact details. So love to, love to catch up afterwards and answer any questions. Uh, follow up with any 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 thoughts. Um, I, I work as an architect in in um, in London as, as a data architect in London for the big banks. And these are these are thoughts um, about data, data quality uh, management driven from that that experience and the the requirements from the regulators. So we'll be covering um, qu- quite a lot of ground um, uh, about the frameworks for data quality, um, about the new kind of technologies, the semantic technologies, and how they support these new regulatory requirements. Um, the final outcome is, I think, that we're going to be su- is surprising for, for me anyway about about the agility and and, and cost savings that could be driven from from this process. But I think the main take out I, I I get from thinking about when I think about this is. This is, really is a, 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 a massive change in the way everybody does their work. It is simply not more business as usual. This is a real sea change, a real opportunity um, to, to, to change the way everybody, everybody does business. Um, now, of course, it's been driven uh, by the uh, global financial crisis. When, when that hit, the banks uh, could not respond fast enough um, to, to the regulators' requirements. And... Um, the regulators, I think, formed a pretty dim view of the, of the ability of the banks to, to manage themselves. Um, I, I guess, if for no other reason than the, than the big ticket amounts of money that had to be uh, funded by, from taxpayers and others. So, the, 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 this whole BCBS 239 data risk aggregation uh, program and, and the data quality um, obligations that it brings um, are driven, I think, first of all, by the fact that the regulators um, don't trust the banks. For a start, you know, when you look at LIBOR and those kinds of scandals, you know for, for, for a fact that the, the, the regulators feel they can't trust necessarily trust every individual in every bank. Um, you see this is from, from um, an article on LIBOR from, from a week ago. Um, and, when, and when you see bankers talking like this, you can understand the regulators have got to take a pretty dim view of, of some, of the, some of the opportunities for, for, for fraud and for, and for mismanagement. Um, so the, their response to this kind of um, outcome, this kind of way, view of banking, um, was in the first case to, to ask them to, to uh, send more reports, more data. And so your know, MIFIDs and all these kinds of programs, uh, Dodd-Franks, ma- massively increased the, the volume of reporting that the banks had to do. But of course, the, the banks the, uh, failed in the eyes of the, of the regulators. Um, this particular uh, Merrill Lynch event was a result of something like 130 million misreported transactions. After Georgina here, who I, um, I'm pretty sure is a, a firm-handed person, uh, says that she actually met personally with Merrill Lynch and they still failed to get 130 million transactions right. So the outcome of that, uh, that they can't trust the people, they can't trust the, um, the banks to, 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 to report, was that they... That they asking now, they are now asking for arbitrarily complex views of data, reports of data, virtually real time with very fast turnarounds. Um, so there's no limit now to what data they can ask for uh, on an ad hoc basis. Right? Now, the, this has highlighted the, the uh, re- requirements for BCBS 239 because we'll have a look at the way that the banks respond in the traditional approach to responding to this requirement to take any view of data across any of the bank systems. Right? The traditional approach right, is your, your data warehouse right, strategy. You, you, you need to run a query, on, um, you need the data to be in one place. You, you can't run with SQL, you can't run data queries across systems. But more importantly, you've, got to, um, you've also got to have the data congruent. So this, this is a snapshot from, uh, from uh, you know, Open Gamma, their website. We, we like Open Gamma, and we're going to be standing a copy of Open Gamma um, uh, risk, risk uh, management system on our demonstration pl- uh, platform over the next few weeks. 
Um, but their, their approach is the traditional one. You know, you've got multiple sources of data, traditional your trading systems, risk systems, external data. You normalize it, you validate it, you enrich it, and you put it into a data warehouse. And, and then you answer the queries uh, from, from there. You've got, you've got the data to get, and you've got it congruent uh, in order to write and run your queries. But, but if we ha have a look at the, the basics of that strategy, um, the first is that the data is, is again, is, is duplicated. So we've got multiple source systems, um, multiple source systems, and the data from each one of them is transformed into a different format in, both, in, in, in each case, and then merged into a third version into the data warehouse. So the, the data now is in three places. Thatcher is now in three places, not, not, not even two. Worse than that, the, the, um, the, the complex business rules about how the, the data um, relates and the lineage of the data. You know? So the, the complexity of the database, the, the data warehousing approach is inherent just from a single diagram. When you think that a bank has got hundreds, possibly thousands of databases, with each of them passing the data around, duplicating the data like this at every step of the way, you can see you end up with something massively complex. And I just thought I might give a measure of that complexity. If I just take an example, if I say, mathematically, right? if I say that there are, uh, how many columns are there in a database table? If I said there was 10, the number of queries could be approximated to the factorial of 10. Right? I'm going to use double because um, factorial double isn't handled as much bigger numbers. But if I look at what's, how many queries can I write against a table, how many possible ways that they're querying a table? So, well, how many tables per database? If I said there was another 10, uh, then, 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 then there we go. Ah, oh, it was B, B2, that should be B1, I'm sorry. So there are 3 million queries to write against a table of 10 databases, 10 columns. The num if I was to say how many uh, columns are there in, in 10 databases, I end up with 100 columns. If I now copy that, how many, way, how many queries are there that I can run against one database of 10 tables, it's 9 to the 150 with 157 zeros after it. That's one database. The banks have thousands. The complexity of what they are asking for is, um, is quite unbelievable. And so because they can't trust the people, because they can't trust the... The, uh, the, the queries, the reports that they're getting, and the, and the banks can't answer ad hoc queries fast enough. They've gone to the next level with BCB GIS 239, and, and they're telling the banks how to do their business, how to run uh, their data architecture. So if you look at the uh, BCB GIS 239 paper and the measures that they're doing and the in, uh, investigations they're doing of the banks and their data architecture, you'll see that they're, they're asking the banks, they're telling the banks that they will have a data architecture, they'll have a, uh, a taxonomy, they'll have a data dictionary, um, they will do data quality in a reasonably prescriptive way. They're, they're, you, you can see there they're talking about the adaptability, the timeliness, the accuracy, the complete comprehensiveness, the frequency, the distribution, all of these things are being very specific about uh, how a bank is going to manage its data. So uh, we're going to now drill down into how to go about that. Given this incredible complexity, how do you go about measuring data quality uh, in that environment? Right? Now, I'm going to rely on the EDM Council's definitions, and they, they talk about if you um, if you if you've seen their paper their paper on data quality, they, they've broken it down into seven domains of data quality. So they're not just talking about sort of I'll say correctness. You know, is the date in in the in the date of birth field is is it the correct format? Um, they're actually talking about consistency, accuracy, timeliness. Right? Now, given that data quality is hard enough to, to measure in a simple terms, how do, you, how do you measure your data quality in terms of all of those dimensions, these really soft dimensions? Right? And this is where I think that, that the new breakthroughs are coming. There are, are really fantastic ways of managing these problems, and we'll talk about some of those now. They, they, they leverage um, semantic technology. Um, I'm going to talk about the data point model. Because the solution to this problem of, of massive, massive complexity um, and massive, massive volumes of data is, is to break the, the, the break the data down into its atomic level. Right? It, it's no good uh, treating uh, data as 
tables in databases and databases as islands. We've got to be able to break the data down into its atomic level and wire it together so that we can get views dynamically on the fly. Now, when we're talking about here, potentially millions and billions and trillions of possible queries, we've got to find ways of, of, of being more, far more agile and far more dynamic. And, and, uh, and that's done, I think, using the, the data point model. And we'll talk about the data point model uh, now as, as a backdrop to how, how we measure data quality. Um, the, the data point model is a, kind of a meta model for way, a way of understanding data. It's not unlike RDF or graph databases and uh, those kinds of ways of thinking. It's a structure for how to think about, the, about your data. And I'll, I'll call out two, two points for, for, the, for the purpose of this conversation. Um, the first is that in a data point model, you separate the value from the data point. So what we're trying to do here is eliminate, um, eliminate data duplication. So um, if I talk about, if I said there was a, a client table um, and there's a million clients in the table and each client had a date of birth, then uh, there's going to be a million values for data, date of birth. But... Um, uh, let, let's say that there's uh, birthdays, over for your customers can be up to 100 years old, and there's 100 times 365, 30, 35,000 possible DOBs, date of births. But in your Oracle table or your spreadsheet, you're keeping a million values. Right? Now, that, the data point model um, uh, uh, treats, separates the data point, the million data points, the million clients, from the values. So the million clients point to a DOB, they don't store an individual value for a DOB. That's the first concept for simplifying your data structure. But more importantly for our conversation is that the, the, um, the structure of the data, what in the data point model is called the aspects, is what, what, um, related to each other by, by data itself. So in an Oracle table, the fact that the client has a DOB is in the schema of the Oracle table. In a data point model, the fact that uh, client, the client and the date of birth have a relationship is a piece of data, not in the, in, hidden away in the schema of the database. Now, that, that means that we can start to manipulate the data uh, schema on the fly, and it means that we can take our physical data structures, databases, spreadsheets, and uh, wire together the view of that data using the data point model and semantic technology on the fly, we've separated the structure of the of the data from the, the, the from the data itself, and we've, by do, we've done that by breaking it down into individual concepts and enabling it to be wired back together again. Now, as a, as a side, as a, as, a, as a benefit of this approach, you can see we've eliminated the data warehouse. In the data point model world, you don't have a database. You do not transform the data. You don't duplicate the data. You leave the data in place and you wire together your view of that data on the fly. Right? And that's an unbelievable massive saving, saving uh, in costs, and it's massively agile compared to the traditional kind of banking way of solving this, the, these problems. So um, I thought what we would do is uh, some demonstrations of this process, this, uh, this approach. Um, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going we're to create a, a congruent logical data model. Our first problem is how to wire together uh, a congruent, a consistent view of all, all these potentially hundreds or thousands of databases, spreadsheets, reg reports. Uh, how can you get a consistent view across the whole bank? Um, and we'll talk about uh, sort of how industrialization of that process using tooling to, to, to help us with that. Um, but even once you've, once you've decomposed the, the component systems or databases and spreadsheets into their sort of the data point model view, their, their atomic view, the next step is to synthesize that view into, into something that you can run a query against, right? or you can understand holistically. You can get a view of the whole bank's data in one place. Once you've got that, then you're in a position, step three, is that you can start to put in place your data quality measures right, for you know, testing real-world data, but also testing things like timeliness and some of those more soft aspects. Um, once you've got the measures in place, then you can provide your analysis report and, and your data quality metrics. So let's have a look at that. Now, the, fir the first process, the first one example, um, is, is a spreadsheet. 
So what we're looking at here is a, an example of a, of a, of a risk report. Um, we've got well, in our in our in the um, the site we're going to stand up as a demonstration. We'll have a London report, a Red Australian report, a North American report, and to what it means to re-engineer, to reverse engineer a data into data point model form, a spreadsheet is to take the concepts in the spreadsheet from the x-axis and the y-axis uh, and create in your data model, in your data point model, the aspects uh, and the data points from, from the spreadsheet. Uh, so here's a spreadsheet. If I go back across into, into Magic to our data, our data modeling tool, you can see, if I zoom in here, Oh, sorry, I'll show you the spreadsheet first of all, sorry. This is an example of a spreadsheet. These are the dimensions, uh, the aspects that are the, of the, from the rows, and there's an equivalent set of concepts across the top here for the columns. Right? So we've got marks market valuation, hedge ratio, and for each of those we've got values for uh, the different types of products. So we've got product concepts and we've got risk measure concepts. So if in tooling, if I was to, I'm not going to run this because it'll, it'll uh, take too long, but if I import a spreadsheet right, into a data point model format, I get a diagram that looks like this, and I'll just zoom into here. You can see here what we've done is we've taken out from the spreadsheet the concepts right, from the rows and the columns, and we've given them uh, a name, a uh, product, Risk measure. Right? There's a concept for the whole for the actual report, right? and the uh, each of those aspects has data points, has values. Right? That's this over here. They come in. They come in, in lists of values, and the the values are um, uh, uh, correspond to a data point. So there's data. I'm going to zoom in a bit further. So there's a data point concept, and there's the va the value you can see is separate from the actual data point itself. And you can see, so that's an example of how we can quickly reverse engineer uh, a spreadsheet into data point model form. Another example, right, to reverse engineer a database, we can take a, um, a data point uh, model of a database, we can reverse engineer a database um, in, in the same kind of way. We end up with a, a model that looks very much like the same one, surprisingly, because it's both a database both the data point models. If I look at reg reporting, there's another example. Right? So I've got, I don't, I don't know if you know XBRL. XBRL is the, the standard that the, um, the regulators have used globally for regulatory reporting. So US GAAP, um, in Europe they've got FinREP and CoREP. They're all examples of XBRL taxonomies. They are the, 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 the data required by the regulator. It comes with definitions and structures and uh, uh, and, and massive amounts of data. The, the US GAAP, for example, but if it was a spreadsheet, it'd have something like 13,000 columns. Um, and I know that because we, we reverse engineered it. But the view that we get from by reverse engineering a, 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 a experimental taxonomy um, is the concepts. Right? So in this case, we've got a concept here for, for, for the data in the report. In, in the, in the um, uh, JP Morgan... Uh, taxonomy for the K10 uh, report. There's a, there's a concept for the document and entity information, right? which is made up of the fiscal year, the registration name of the of the company, the document type, the period end date, and the amendment flag. So what we've done is we've reverse engineered from the taxonomy the concepts in the taxonomy. Now they have values, right? and each of those values is, corresponds to a data point. Now here's an example of where of the advantage of separating out the data point from its value. You can see here the, the, uh, the, the data point for the name of the company has two dimensions. So can you see there, there's one relationship to the actual name, the actual value. There's another relationship to the period end date. So that's, a, that's how you model. We've modeled here one data point has two, two, dimension, two concepts here. One is that it's got a value, the JP Morgan Chase is the name, but also the as at 2013, so that we've given an as at dimension to that data point. Now that's a, that's that's exactly how we wire data point models together. We we take a data point and we wire in, we relate, we link to the other concepts around that data point. And this is the kind of the genius, the the, the brilliance of the data point model, 
is that it enables us to dynamically and on, on the fly wire concepts together. You know? Another example is ontologies. A big part of getting a, a consistent, a congruent view of all your data in order that you can do data quality um, metrics um, is that you must have an agreed business language that all the business can agree to. That things need to be expressed in a common language. And the financial industry um, business ontology is a, is a council effort to, to develop a standard language. And likewise, we can just as we can import spreadsheets and, and uh, taxonomies and databases, we can import ontologies. So let's have a quick look at an example of that. So if we reverse engineer the, the FIBO ontology around uh, law slash jurisdictions, you can see coming in here concepts like right, statute law, legal system. All, all these concepts have got um, applies in, governs. Right? These are all concepts from FIBO, geopolitical entity, right? jurisdiction. Right? All of these concepts have come from FIBO and we've reverse engineered them into our data point model. Right. So now we've got the concepts from the spreadsheet, the concepts from the text the reg reports, the concepts from all the data, in-house databases, and we've got a global f financial um, language all defined in a common place, in a common data model. Right. It's integrated. Well, it's not integrated yet. We're about to integrate it. We've, we've got all the, day, all the um, metadata in one place in a format that's enabled to, it to be wired together. Right, so that's our next challenge. So now we need to start taking uh, multiple uh, views of the data that, that originally were in different databases and different spreadsheets and wiring them together. We've got the data point, it's all in data point model form, we can now wire it together. So we can take a, uh, the concept of a risk report right, from, from the spreadsheets, the fact that there was a London risk report and an Australian risk report, um, and the fact that both Australian risk report and London risk report are both types of risk report. We've also got from the um, ontology a concept of a reporting jurisdiction, right? And we've got data points of Australia and the United Kingdom. So now we can wire together the ontology, the, 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 the business definitions of what, what is the jurisdiction, together with the, the, the metadata, the, the, the data that's in the, in the spreadsheet. We've now got consistency across spreadsheets and, and if we take the, step, take the logical step of now doing the same thing to the databases, now we can go from spreadsheet to database um, to reg report right, in, in the terms of the, uh, the, the business language of the, of the ontology of, of, um, of FIBO. So we're, we're wiring together all the views into one consistent data point model. Now, the, the problem then, now, now that we've got the data in one place and it's wired together, there's a couple of ways that we can build um, some data quality tests. The first is that we, we have a, uh, is to take, is, is the traditional approach of, ma of, of, of running our tests, um, running our tests against the physical data. So uh, things like mandatory fields, are they missing? Right. Have we got a list of valid, va do all the fields have all, uh, consistent with the val set of valid values? Is there duplication? Does the data have a different incorrect format? All of these rules about the data are in our data point model. And we can use um, queries. Uh, we can design a query for in the data point model to run against the physical systems to test those, that, the, the real world data against the logic, uh, the semantics and the, and the syntax of our, from the data point model. So the, 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 the traditional approach is easily, easily handled. The next question, though, is that a more difficult one, and and that is all, and that is that we've got soft concepts, right? So, like for example, how do you possibly measure the timeliness of data? Well, what I'm going to want to suggest is that we uh, we model the data, we make, we model the concept of timeliness, right? So, let's say we have a concept of, of a refresh data refresh cycle, right? We then build a data point model of refresh cycles. We've now got concepts in the data model, like London close, New York close, right, Asian close. They are examples of refresh cycles. And then it is then a matter of simply taking the, the, that model and wiring in to the actual data, right, that, for example, the risk measures. 
if we can wire together, we can join the risk measure and the time cycle uh, model, then now we know the time cycle uh, refresh rates of the risk measures. Uh, and that is in the, in, in the tooling, because we've got um, uh, the, the data in a visual data point model format, though that process is as simple as um, drag and drop. So I can take, I can take concepts from my uh, spreadsheet model. Right? I can then go and pick a, a concept from, from another part of the model and I drag and drop those concepts onto the, onto, the, onto the palette, onto the design, and then I relate the two concepts and say, now you know, this thing is related to that thing. So this risk measure has this time cycle. All right. Now one of the things that we could say about the, um, the complexity of that element is that um, the, the difference between semantic technology and, and traditional sort of SQL database querying is that in a semantic technology, there, uh, there is a, is a constant concept of in inference. So the query can the, 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 en the query the engine running the query can can do inferencing over the the meta model across the data point model across the ontology. So an example might be um, we might tag something as an apple, and we might tag something else as a as a banana. If in our ontology we've got a concept of fruit and we've said that an apple is a type of fruit and a banana is a type of fruit, then we can write a query against asking for all the fruit and we'll get back all the apples and all the bananas. Right? Even though we didn't ask for apples and bananas, we got them back because they are types of fruit and the ontology, the model, knows that they're both types of fruit. So this inheritance concept and, and inferencing is, is a massively powerful way of, of simplifying the, the writing of, of, of any query, but certainly data quality metrics. Now, the ability to, to, to infer new rules from existing uh, models, uh, it means that the data quality measures can, can be written with queries that are far, far simpler than you could do if it was with, if you were using SQL. Now, you're going to need that because the model you're dealing with, the data point model that you've, you've assembled, has got thousands, hundreds of thousands of concepts in it. And so the, the, um, the, the, the semantic technology is absolutely critical to any data quality effort, I, I would have thought. I can't see any, any other way around it. The traditional SQL kind of ways of doing it are, 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 are inadequate. Right. So, so that, that's how we can handle concepts like, like timeliness, um, by building a, a model of timeliness and wiring it together with our model of our data. Other kinds of tests, like there's one of the dimensions is consistency. Well, consistency would be some kind of measure about how, how does the data from system A get into system B. Right? Now, if we've reverse engineered system A and we've reverse engineered system B and we've mapped them back up to, the, to, to an ontology, to, to our global language, now we can get from system A to system B via the meaning of the data and we can therefore measure the consistency. Uh, 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 conformity. Can, can we, if we wire up the, our, our database, all our databases to the, to the data point model and, uh, and FIBO, then we can get conformity, right? How well do the systems, um, their definitions, match up to the global definition that we have that we've got from FIBO, from um, US GAP, right, from all of those um, sources of meaning right, from the regulators and, and, and the, and the uh, corporate definitions. So that's how we can measure conformity. So the data point model is, and, uh, has given us the ability to run arbitrarily complex queries across all of our data, uh, I guess all the bank's data, in, in a language that, in a consistent language, it's congruent. Right? And so the, uh, the, the tooling for querying based on semantic technologies um, is going to give us infinitely more flexible, more agile. Agile, someone said to me, agile is not a word you hear data architects talk about. You know, your software guys talk about that, but not data architects. Well, this, this brings agility to the data architecture. Yeah. And that kind of brings us then to what happens then. And, and this is where, the, where the, our tool comes in. Typically, the, the, the data quality dashboard approach is to take the results of those queries and put them into a kind of a weighted sum kind of model. So if I go, where's my spreadsheet here? So if you'd like a copy of this tool, um, uh, just uh, let, let, let me know. 
but but the typical approach for for measuring data quality, the dashboard kind of thing, is to take one dimension being your data. So what we've got here is we've got the domains of data uh, again as as row in rows. Um, it's quite typical to give them a, a, a weighting because you, you know the party the identifiers are typically more important than the, than the values um, of the entities. Um, the uh, and, and what, what happens then is um, we define a set of rules for the data to measure coverage, conformity, consistency, accuracy, duplication. So now we've got the data going down and across. We've got a set of tests or rules for measuring um, the dimensions of data quality and we then run those queries on the database against the, against the, either the model which a lot of this stuff can be done against the model but sometimes it comes to real data of course and what that gives us is each of our uh, dimensions for each, of, for each of our data classes and attributes and, and, uh, and real world data that gives us a score for each of, uh, of our data. We do some sort of weighted sum. Uh, and of course, then the total of all of that gives us some sort of metric about the, the quality of our data overall, given the weightings and the volumes of data and how correct each of those is according to our criteria, our set of rules. So this spreadsheet is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an example of how to go about that, of doing that. And if you'd like a copy, as I say, please, please let me know. No, no problem. Um, the pleasure. So the next question that comes up is now, now that we've got a set of rules run against the model for measuring the data quality, and we've got tools for scoring that and tracking that over time, the next question comes is how do we validate the model? And that's actually one of the really, really, uh, I think, exciting things about the data point model, is that what, what, what we, we obviously can't ask SMEs and business people to, to validate complex you know, data models, UML diagrams and class diagrams or schemas or whatever. Um, but what we can do is transpose that or, or expose to them that model as, as facts. So we can break, because the data point model has broken things down into its atomic level, it's quite a simple process of defining the facts of, of that model. So, you know, the, the typical example is a uh, credit default swap is a type of swap, a swap is something this. And then break down the concepts into individual rules that can be true or false. Uh, that's what I, that's what I would call a fact model. So the, uh, the the business validation of the business of the of the data point model of the of the model of the schemas of the data is very very doable because you've got these concepts of uh, you've got this fact model that the business is can can understand it. it it's voluminous but it's simple. And they can validate the data, the the the, uh, the schemas and the and the meta model, or the metadata, and the, and the data point models using English language, and so that is a way of guaranteeing the quality of your data model against which you're running your data quality measures. So, in conclusion, I I think my, my summary would be is that the um, the data quality metrics and measures and and the solutions required for data quality touch absolutely every part of the, of the business. The, um, all the systems, all the databases, all the business processes, all contribute to the data quality um, uh, problem or solution. Um, but, that, but the only way of getting a holistic, um, single um, solution, a, a comprehensive solution, an efficient solution, that's a better way of putting it, an efficient solution uh, is to have a, uh, a, a, a some kind of data point model that, ha and you need a data point model because it's the only way you can bring together hundreds, possibly thousands of very complex schemas of data. The, um, I, 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 I've come up with seven, seven outcomes. Uh, and, um, and, and rules that uh, take away points that for, for, for me anyway. And that is that the, the, the first one is that, that the physical world is, is far too hard-coded, complex, duplicated and, and um, sort of hidden in silos uh, to be able to run data quality measures against anything but a model of the real world. So any solution must be model-based. Now, if you're going to do a, uh, have a model, the model has to be 100% comprehensive. It cannot be just data. It's got to be process. It's got to be business rules. UML, I think, is the only language for, for that, as far as I know. Um, and the problem with the UML as it stands is that it has concepts like T 
table and class. It, 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 it hard codes into the schema of things the, 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 the meaning of the data. Whereas the data point model is, assist, is an approach to breaking down the data into its atomic level. And that's the only way you're going to be able to get solutions on the fly is by wiring together atomic level concepts. You know? In order to get... Um, the, the, the complexity is such that there's no way that a traditional SQL, you know, Oracle kind of solution, data, data warehouse solution will, will, will meet, meet the requirements. You therefore need semantic technology and Sparkle queries and, and these sort of things that can handle inferencing. Um, the, the, the scope is there is no data that doesn't that BCBS two three nine doesn't cover. There, there's risk data. Everything is potentially risk data. The, the regulators are going to ask for data on the fly. They're going to say this afternoon I want you to tell me this. Um, that means that this process has to be. Um, overlaid to every system in the bank so every virtually every person in the bank is going to be involved certainly everyone everyone dealt with the system or an organizational structure a budget right? um, is going to be involved um, the, the result is actually something simpler simple not complex right so so the end result of, of what seems like a massively complex thing, and it is massively complex, it can actually be viewed in a simplistic way that the business can engage with. Um, but so my seventh point, my final point, would be that if you make this effort, and, and I don't think people have got a choice, but if you, when, you, when you make this effort right, to, 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 to um, break down your, your data into its atomic level, to put it all into one data model, to understand it with a with a global language, uh, to be able to run queries across the databases without a data warehouse, you are eliminating massive, massive, massive layers of duplication and cost. And I don't know what's the opposite of agility, but you become massively more agile. Solutions on the fly without having to build a database are massively cheaper and massively faster. And whether um, a lot of people don't realize, I think, but we're, we're in the middle of that transform now where, where it takes $10 million and six to 12 months to put up a simple uh, data warehouse solution. Um, it's going to be hours, minutes, days, weeks, and certainly with a small number of people, not, not, not a massive team. So, so it's a new world order, and it's great to be a data architect in, this, in, this, uh, in, in 2015. Thanks very much, Greg, for that presentation. Uh, we'd invite any questions uh, at this point if you'd uh, like to uh, give us your name and ask your question. If there are any questions, I, I would like to say that um, there's, I've got here some uh, some terms uh, for Googling. So there's the BSB 239 paper. There's a very good paper on data quality, good, very good work being done by the EDM Council on data quality. Um, there's uh, uh, the data point model from the ECB. There's some, some fantastic work on there, reg reporting. And another really good um, piece of work is the, if you look, if you search for XBRL abstract model, um, you'll, you'll, you'll come up with uh, a data point model there that's been defined for XBRL. Up, upcoming, if you, upcoming for, from our, our side of things, that we'll have a, a webinar next, uh, each month. Um, at this stage, the next one is about taming XBRL and regulatory reports using a global language, so untangling uh, reg reports, global reg reports, and uh, making them consistent and, and in a business um, consistent language. Um, in the next month or so, we'll be standing up a, re a, a demonstration site so that um, we can run these queries, run, run these processes on the web, and you can see for yourself, run, try running some tests and do, do, do some things for yourself. Um, if you'd like a copy of the spreadsheet, let me know. If you'd like a copy of the data point modeling software, that's, that's no problem. That doesn't cost anything. Um, and certainly, if you'd like a deep dive um, into some of these questions um, and explore some issues or challenge me on whatever, you, whatever, whatever something I've said, um, then you know, a, a Skype session costs nothing. So re really welcome the opportunity to talk, to talk further about, about any, any, uh, any issue. And our website is www.modeldrus. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining today. Oh, great. Thanks, Simon.